Peace of Christ be with you. One of the joys I have as the dean of the chapel is to get to introduce friends to friends. One of the joys I get to do is to introduce Hope College, my friends, to friends that come in from outside and step into this space and hear your voice worship. And I get to introduce you to them. And tonight is one of those rare privileges. I get to introduce you to the provost of Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary, though when I first met him, he was teaching preaching and homiletics at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. He was also the academic director of the Brem Center, which was set aside for the dedication and exploration of worship theology in the arts. He's a scholar, he's a pastor ordained in the ELCA. He is hands down my favorite Lutheran. <laughs> he is the Reverend Dr. Clay Schmidt, and he's here with Western Seminary for the Bass Preaching Festival, but he's here tonight. Would you give him a warm Hope College welcome to our favorite Lutheran? Thank you, brother. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm thrilled to be here and to share God's word from Romans 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind of them that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you... You are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of the sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, my brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you will put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have two kids, and they're about your age, so let me talk to you as I start, like a dad, for just a second. When you were all very tiny, first year or so of your life, my daughter was about your age. And she would wake up chipper every morning. Now, I'm sort of a, a late sleeper, especially on sa Saturdays when I've been up every morning for work and on Sunday up very early to preach. And then on Saturday morning was the day to sleep in, of course. And, and uh, I loved to do that, and I didn't like it to be interrupted, except for about a year and a half period when my daughter, Kiri, your age again, was about nine months old. She just learned how to speak. And every morning about six o'clock, Kiri would wake up happy and smell it, but happy. And from my slumber, every morning I would hear this, Papa, Papa. She'd be leaning on her crib, waiting for someone to wake up and come and pick her up and play with her, six in the morning. Well, I was happy to do it. 
even though I'd probably gotten up in the middle of the night to change her diaper. Still, happy to do it. Because when somebody says, Papa, you have to respond. How it swells and warms the heart of a parent when a little one like that says that, calls out that name, a name you do, do not deserve. What in the world could, could a parent have done to justify the joy that comes when a little one calls you by such a beloved name as that, or Daddy, or Mommy? I asked Pastor Trigg if I could get away with this. He said, it's okay. Papa, he's the guy that changes your diaper joyfully. Can you imagine that? I developed this little cha diaper changing song. It's called Baby Poop. He said I could sing it for you. It goes like this. Baby poop, you've got the greenest little baby poop. And it smells just like a chicken coop. Scoop for scoop. Oh, my head is reeling. Look out, don't hit the ceiling, baby poop. I just can't figure how the best darn kid in town can poop a half a ton and still be having fun in that good old baby poo. <laughs> well, I can't think of another setting in which I'd say that, sing that in a sermon. <laughs> Pastor Trigg has my email. When you become a parent and you want access to that song, send him a note. He'll send it to you. It's amazing what that means. It means that the person who can change your baby poop, your smelly diaper, is Abba, is Father, is Daddy, is Papa, is that person. And it means that this little tyke, before she or he has any idea of what it means to claim belonging or innocence or, or intimacy or family, they know this, that Mommy is going to show up when you call, that Daddy is going to be there that there is some entity surrounding her small little life that is powerful and encompassing and secure. I have a friend who said that when his daughter was young, she called him daddy. And then when she got a little older, a little more sophisticated, she called him dad. And then when she got to college and really felt like she was getting quite sophisticated, she started to call him father. And then when she wanted to get married, she went back to calling him daddy. And he said, every time she changed what she called me, it cost me more money. <laughs> My daughter called me Pops. She decided when she was in high school, from now on, I'm not going to call you Dad. I'm going to call you Pops. And Pops it's been ever since, and I'm not sure what that's going to cost me. <laughs> Here's the thing. Everybody needs a place to belong. And this word helps us to understand these words, these intimate words, help us to understand that place where we belong as children and as families. Everybody needs a place to build intimate family and close friendships, relationships. You're probably all far too young to ever have heard of one of my favorite old comedians, a guy by the name of Groucho Marx. And he, he used to joke about this, and he used to say, I refuse to join a club that would stoop to have me as a member. But we all need a place to join, to belong. Now, a lot of you I know are in psychology classes, and like I did when I was at your age in college, I started to read some of these psychological studies. You've probably read this one about these tiny babies in an orphanage that were cared for very deeply. They were given good food and everything they need for shelter and warmth, but they didn't have enough companionship. They didn't have enough people holding them, picking them up and caressing them, and these orphans that were so well cared for began to die. And they wondered why, and they began to realize that even before you need food and warmth and security, you need human touch. And without it, you cannot exist. It's not just little children or folks like you or folks my age. Everyone needs a place to belong. One of my favorite Robert Frost poems is about a man called Old Silas. In this poem, he tells the story of this, farm, this farmer couple that had this hired hand who's not very reliable. His name is Old Silas. And he comes and goes as he pleases, and it seems like he's always going away about the time that he's most needed. And it seems like he's always coming back to the farm about the time that he's most broke or too tired to do any work. 
And the farmer said, that's the end of it. It's not going to happen anymore. You're not coming back. And yet, one day he showed up on the doorstep. And his wife knew why, the farmer's wife. She said, well, he's, he's coming home. And the farmer said, what do you mean, home? And she said, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. So Silas came home, and he sat lazily in the wooden chair beside the stove, and he fell asleep. And later, when they came to check on him, Silas had died. We all need a place called home. We all need a place to belong. Jesus needed it. I love those stories about the disciples. Jesus gathered around him this group of, of 12 friends. Some of them became very, very good friends, very close to him. He gave them nicknames, just like we do with our close friends. He called Peter the Rock. He called James and John the Sons of Thunder. Just like us. He needed those close, intimate relationships to help sustain his life, to give him a sense of who he belonged with and where to go. And then he had one particular nickname that he used that is really astonishing. Paul refers to it in our lesson. It's the name Abba. Did you hear that in the text? Abba. Now, Abba is an interesting word. It's, it's not a Greek word, and, and the New Testament is written in Greek. It's not a Greek word. It's an Aramaic word, which is, of course, the language that Jesus would have spoken. And it's such an interesting and intimate word that, that they didn't even translate it from the Aramaic into the Greek. They just kept it there, and they put Abba in the Greek. And guess what? We don't translate it in the English. We translate it. We carry it straight over through the Greek and into English. Abba. And you know what it means? It means Papa. It means Daddy. It means something intimate, something close. Imagine you're so close to God that you would call God like Jesus did, our Abba who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The most intimate possible name for God. And how dare we call God that? How dare we be so intimate with God? Well, Paul tells us why. He says we are heirs with Christ. We are through the Spirit made brothers and sisters with Christ. We are that close to God that we can call him Papa, Dad, Pops. Paul says, when we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God and with Christ, fellow heirs of God. That word Abba suggests closeness, intimacy, family, connection. Paul even uses the word adoption. We are adopted to be in God's family. That's what this word is about. That's what this text is about. Paul is telling us that when we live the life of the Spirit, we are connected with God in such an intimate way. Everything that God has to give is ours. And then he talks about another thing called living in the flesh, which, of course, we all do to some degree. We all live in the flesh. And when we do, we gain a sense of not belonging to the kingdom of God. And, and when we live in the flesh, we try to find other places to belong to make up for that. When our mind is on the flesh and not on the spirit, it'll make us spend our lives looking for the place to belong. I had a friend once tell, friend once tell me the story of a young girl named Amy. Amy was very young. She was born of an African-American father and a white mother, but she never knew her parents. She was left as an orphan, and she was raised in an orphanage, and they kept looking for a place for her, and they found an adoptive home for Amy, and that worked for a while. And then it fell apart, and she was pulled out of that home, and, and then they worked hard, the social workers, and found another place for Amy to go, to be adopted into another family, and they went, she went there, and that worked for a while. And then eventually, those parents couldn't take it, and she was taken out again by the age of seven. Just imagine how tragic that is. This, this young person who has this tremendously deep sense of, of, of need for a place to live, a place to, to, to feel secure, a person to call mom or dad. Imagine how heartbreaking it would be, how, how scarring for the soul it would be to be taken out of that. And one day, the social worker came into Amy's room and she found her sitting on the floor scratching deeply, deeply at her skin to remove its color 
so that she could fit in. When you live in the flesh, you have to find some other way to fit in. Fitting in can become an obsession. Paul says, for those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, he says, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And if you set your mind on the flesh, you're going to be filled with obsessions to find a way to fit in. It'll take over how you prepare yourself, how you look, what clothing you buy, how you, how you style your hair. It'll take over what you feel and what you act and what you do. And it'll take over the kinds of things that we know drive us away from God. And it'll drive us toward experimentation. Now I understand. I was in college too. I know that's a time where you're supposed to experiment to some degree in chemistry class. <laughs> you're supposed to experiment. But, but there are so many things at your age to try. And so many things are so harmful. And so many of them are just, are just corruptions of our bodies. You hear this line, it's, it's never, you can never be too thin or too rich. And so some people, especially girls, I understand, do anything they can, even throw up their food to, to be thin enough. Or maybe you have to have the right haircut or wear the right clothing. Or maybe you experiment with drugs or alcohol or sex. Maybe all of those things are living in the flesh in a way that is your college-age experiment. Who knows? You do. But that's being separated from the Holy Spirit and what God has in mind for us. One of the ways we separate ourselves is by our, our school team colors and our mascots. Now, I want to tell you, I am a blue gold, and you wouldn't have any idea what that is. I went to the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire, which is straight west of here quite a ways. And our mascot was the blue golds. Yours is the Dutchman, is that right? And you're the orange and blue folks? Yeah. Well, we were the Blue Golds, and, and that isn't anything. That's not a real mascot. That's just a couple of colors, but we didn't have a mascot. <laughs> it worked for us. We had, a, we had a, a sticker that we would wear during basketball games that said, what in the hell is a Blue Gold? <laughs> I went back to, uh, to my college bookstore several years ago, and some, some knucklehead came up with the idea of, they didn't like the idea that the Blue Gold isn't something, so they came up with this this cockamamie rendition of something that they called a blue gold. They just invented this figure. It, it, looked, it looked awful to me. It looked an awful lot like, looked an awful lot like a Calvin Knight. <laughs> hey, I was told that you, uh, they were your rivals. The, the blue golds, the orange and blues, the knights, the Dutchmen. We have these ways of sorting out who we are and who we hang around with. And some of these are pretty innocuous, but some of them are pretty serious. And that's what Paul's talking about, some of these serious things. Nothing, Paul says, nothing in our life works so well for our searching soul as finding the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And that's what he says God gives us. There's no material thing, there's no physical thing that we can acquire in life or that we can do with ourselves or with our bodies. Nothing will give us the satisfaction, the deep intimate connection that we're looking for in life. It doesn't matter if you have a Miley Cyrus haircut or a Bruno Mars wardrobe. Only the Spirit will give us that ultimate resting place, a place where we can belong, a place where we are known and loved and trusted upon. Only the Spirit will give us that Abba place, that Abba place where we worship and we adore God and we go out in action for God and make that part of our life's wor worship as well. A place where we know the same songs and we tell the same stories and we read the scripture and just understand all that God has for us. My son surprised me by, by knowing a scriptural story. One day we were, we were visiting my folks in Wisconsin one summer. He was about 15 years old. 
He said, hey, Dad, let's go out, let's grab the grandpa's 22 rifle out of the den and let's go out and let's shoot some targets in the woods. Great. We love to do that. So we go in the den, we grab my dad's 22, and we're walking out into the woods. And as I walk along, I stop and I say, well, Jake, I've got the, the rifle. Do you have the cartridges? And Jake says, yeah, Dad, I've got them right here. And then he paused and said, but Father, who will provide the sacrifice? I confirmed him on the spot. We know the same stories. We sing the same songs. We meet in that Abba place where we are known by God and by one another, and we are trusted. Now, I just have to tell you that this is that kind of place. I've been hearing about this gathering for a long time, but I'm really astonished to see it with my own eyes. To be honest with you, Pastor Trigg, I, I didn't really believe you. Because it's, it's really hard to believe that 1,000 or 1,200 young college-age students give up a Sunday night when everybody knows you'd rather be home doing homework, <laughs> and you come here to worship. You come here to be with God and to be with God's people, to be in this Abba place and to call out to God and to know God intimately. This is just astonishing. I can't wait to tell other people what I've seen. The Holy Spirit is here with you. I pray that you will always have this spirit with you wherever you choose to worship because it will not always be like this. This gathering, this Abba place is powerful. Here in this place where your skin color doesn't matter or the kind of hair you have doesn't matter or whether you're fat or thin doesn't matter or the colors you wear or whether you're scarred on the inside or the outside, none of these things matter. Here, the place where there's no test to get in, there's no dress code, there's no team color, there's only the Holy Spirit that draws us together and our greatest outward sign on our bodies is only what we do with them, how we care for God's people, how we reach out and touch the hungry, the poor, the lame. That's all it is. Here's a great sign of this, and I just heard about it. It happened last week. Maybe you saw it in the newspapers. You know about Pope Francis, this amazing, humble, spirited man? Pope Francis was holding mass for umpty thousands last week. And somehow there was a man in the audience who was suffering from a disease called neurofibromyatosis. Have you ever heard of that? Maybe you know of it as, as, a, as the source of the elephant man syndrome. When I was younger, there was this movie called Elephant Man. It was about a man that had this tremendous disease, and he was put away in the circus where people could gawk at him. And here, last week, at the Pope's Mass, this elephant man comes forward with his ears filled with pustules and his face covered with large globules of fat, and he's disfigured, and his hair is, is just bursting with these disfigurements. And he comes struggling forward, and the Pope stops everything he's doing, and he looks at him. And when people look, look at this man, they either quickly look away with revulsion, or they're so mesmerized that they, they gape at him morbidly, but not Pope Francis. He looks at him. He beckons him forward. He reaches out his hands. He places them on his, on his shoulders. He hugs this man. You see in the pictures, if you've looked at them, you see the Pope holding him close and kissing him on the head, that ugly, hideous, disgusting head of his. And then he prays for them. That is a sign of the kingdom and of this man being in his Abba place where he is known and loved. I want to offer one caution because when you're in a place like this, it can start to become exclusive and we can think that it's all about us and this can be our club. And we can start to leave other people out. We need to be wary of that. I want to tell you a story about my sister who is a campus pastor, very much like Pastor Trigg. She was at the University of Northern Illinois when this happened. I was at Fuller. I was driving down the street one day listening to NPR 
and I heard this news report, and it was one of these tragic news reports that we all hear about, we feel so bad about. There was another campus shooting. And I'm far off in California, and I'm thinking what I usually do. Well, I'm, I'm terribly upset and sorry for these folks, but it's not close to me. It's distant. It's on the other side of the country. And then as I'm driving and I hear the story in further detail, I realize, I, wait a minute, I, I, I think he said that shooting was at, at the University of Northern Illinois, and I pulled the car over. And I picked up my phone and I called my sister because she's the campus pastor there at the time. She answered the phone. She was very busy. She said, I, I, I can't talk now. I'm, I'm in the hospital. I'm dealing with everything. We've got parents and kids and, and people are a wreck and I, I, I'll talk to you later. Wow. And then after this all took place in her ministry in that place, my sister, the campus pastor, on the front lawn of the campus, men, pa, the campus ministry building, she laid out five, she, she inserted five crosses into the lawn for the five kids that had been killed. And then she did something that made her a pariah in the neighborhood. And people in the community were very angry and deeply upset with what she did next. She put out a sixth cross and people in the community said, what are you doing? There were only five people killed. She said, no, the shooter was killed. And they said, well, why would you put up a cross for him? She said, because God is grieving over the loss of six children, not five. My friends, we are in this Abba place, this gathering, this wonderful place where the Holy Spirit calls us and fills us. Let it not ever become only our place. Let it always be the place that we use to reach out and invite others. Here and wherever you go in your life of worship. Here where you, where you work together and study together and out there where you will work together for the kingdom of God. Let that always be the place where you reach out and draw in and hug and caress and kiss those who are not like us. And let us turn our attention to the table, the communion table, the, the word that has unity or union in it, the table that is intended to be whole, the Holy Spirit's way to draw us together as one. Welcome to this table tonight. And thank you for letting me share this communion with you and this Abba place, which is so dear to you and is now dear to me. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are bold to call you by a name that we have no right to call you. But we trust you and you promise, and Paul tells us that we can call you Dad, Father. And we can be so bold as to call upon you anytime for anything we give you thanks for giving us this place to be with one another and to be near you. We give you thanks for the food, the, the, the bread and the wine that nourish us. We give you thanks for this college that has been a place for all of these young people to grow closer to you. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.